Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to Make Things Monday, episode two. My name is Zinigami, your lovely host, and with me is the wonderful, the lovely, the extra gorgeous Chris DeLeon. Chris DeLeon, say hi. Hello, it's me, Chris DeLeon. Oh, DeLeon, I knew that. I've been, I've been calling hey. you, like, mentally in my head, Leon, this I... whole time. All good. It's a, it's a French-sounding Spanish lost name in an American... English country, I had no wrong way to say stuff. All, <laughs> all right. So uh, if this is your first time here on Make Things Monday, Make Things Monday is a podcast that is a digital show and tell. Uh, we have projects that we're working on here during quarantine while we're all locked away in our rooms and in our houses away from people. And so I just wanted to do this as an opportunity to get my creative juices flowing and help some of the community get their creative juices flowing as well. And so as a reminder, at any point during this show and at any point over the next however many months we're going to be running this if you post things on our discord channel that's discord.gg slash zinigami or type an exclamation mark discord on twitch or follow the link in the youtube description down below you can go over to our discord server go over to the make things monday channel and post whatever projects you'd like to put there if it's art if it's music if it's animation if it's some kind of video or streaming project you're doing on your own post things there and then we can talk about it and share our progress with each each other talk about our struggles talk about what we're doing share our successes and just give a time to really uh, flex those creative juices and have fun with things with the community and with everyone else so Chris tell us a little bit about what you do and why uh, why I decided to bring you here I just want to see if you know why I brought you here <laughs> Sure, yeah. So uh, what I do is I teach game development uh, most of my life, the past, maybe since the late 1990s. I've been making video games, and I've been in and out of big companies, small companies, mid-sized uh, startups, academia, and so on, done some indie stuff. But on the side of all of that, every single year I release four or five freeware games just because I think it's fun to build things. I like to express things that way. I like to learn things that way. I like other people into that type of enjoyment. I think of it like the same reason why lots of folks dance or sing or draw and it's may or may not have an intersection of their career it's just the thing worth doing uh and outside of that there's a bunch of sort of side projects that i just juggle at any given time i've got productivity audio books i'm working on got some stoicism stuff i'm into on the side made a uh, update of that book but basically I like to do side projects like to help people with side projects so at least what i'm guessing was when i saw making these monday i was like i like to make things and i like helping people make things and i'm just all about that energy of people sharing things and collaborating giving feedback to each other and progress and I'm just happy to see that going on. A bunch of the other things I do are also help with Indicate and IGDA and basically try to support other people making stuff. And so I'm happy to see this going on. Yeah, you've been around for quite some time. I've checked out a few of the stuff you've worked on yourself. I'm trying to find the list of things that you've done recently. I feel like I either saw it on your Twitter or it was DM to me. Uh, let's see. No, I think that these are just lists of things that other home team game did. Yeah. I have a list of a whole bunch of games that other home team game dev teams have worked on. Can you tell us a little bit more about home team game dev in general? Sure. It's it's a pretty unconventional approach and sort of at the high level, uh, basically it kind of started from 16 some years ago when I was an undergrad. I helped start a college game development club. And what I figured out was that people were teaching themselves better technical skills, better project management, better collaboration, better creative practical side of things in there for the heck of it because they felt like they wanted to get their game cooler. They wanted to make their thing better than in the classroom where there was, you know, a little more formatted and structured. There's, there's material that's good for, but for the kind of things we were learning, it was a great setting for that. I went off to grad school some years later after a few years in industry, did the same kind of organization at Georgia Tech, but kind of iteration 2.0, same thing. Like that was helping people get jobs and helping people learn new things and meet new people. And so that was a lot of fun. And after grad school, I was kind of like, well, I just want to keep doing this sort of thing. And so I basically kept leveling that up a few more iterations, and that's what Home Team became, where we've got people now in 19 time zones building games together. Uh, they do it all remotely. Uh, it's it's something where, in addition to just like sort of having teamwork stuff, I'm there teaching them. Uh, when they whenever they get stuck, me and my trainers help them out. We got experts and in, or industry folks in level design, audio, game art, uh, so on. I mostly work with them on programming, game design stuff, project management things. But we released every game on time, released 108 games this way the past five years. We bring in guest speakers once a month for industry, to, for our podcast. And uh, it's just become kind of a way for people to to build things. Different people get different things out of it. But it's it's fundamentally just, it's all freeware. N none of it is being sold. None of it is no royalties attached or anything like that. 
it's people building stuff because they want to build it they want to learn through it they want to get things in their portfolio they want to try out a new skill outside their main core skill set and uh it's just sort of a, a one long video game karaoke kind of thing and so if you want to participate i don't have to come i was like i've got my whole team of like four people and we're working on a game together i could just be interested in game development have a little bit of uh definitely a passion for things and like i just want to see what i'm capable see what other people are doing and see if i can throw my hat in to help out with someone else's project and make uh some things that i want to do as well yeah it's it's very much a space where people kind of show up and, and many times it's also where I, part of why it's great that we've been fully remote is that a lot of our people are not in center of los angeles like i am but they're not in new york city or chicago or london or somewhere else so they have kind of a game development hub around where they're at a lot of them it's three hours out of town it's some other state like kind of back where i grew up in the midwest where they don't have a strong connection to a bunch of other peers who want to do this stuff but we help bring in constantly i go out there do things like this my youtube videos my free courses my viral videos whatever bringing people in to work with them we help get people on the same page get people kind of cooperating in a structure train up the ones that are new and it just gets them kind of a constant people coming in wanting to build stuff together supportive of each other and because it's a learning context people come in with no background whatsoever and then we've got courses and things that help ramp them up people want to help each other out with questions and they get stuck or make mistakes and it's just everybody's there to learn and have fun doing it amazing uh did you have a, a link to your the some of the game projects that you made this year uh sure so well so the game projects made this year at least within home team home team game dev.com slash games should i post it over in the yeah you, why don't you post it here on twitch chat and, uh, my viewers can play along while we're twitch chatting chat. here yeah. yes that's a good idea home team game dev.com slash games is a basically it's a redirect to we're big fans of itch.io uh is it going to try to block my posting of a link i don't know if it's one of these maybe we'll we'll just see what happens we'll <laughs> we'll we'll All have right. it happen in uh if if bot decides to yell at you, we'll we'll fix things after that. That that works. I think and this is the, I think I have this page up. Yep, that is the page I have up as well. Yep. So yeah, if that's anyone yeah. here wants to check things out, you can follow that link over on Twitch. Uh, I'll have that link in video description down below if you're following on YouTube, and you can see some of the, the games that uh, Home Team Game Dev are working on. I see how many of these for this year? Twelve this year. No, these uh, so people? there's a there's 108 total so far released out of the five years we've been in operation. It gets a little bit harder to keep track of because we recently split into two groups a year ago. We're starting a third group uh, actually later this month. But yeah, it's an average maybe five, uh, what would be, uh, 20-ish a year, I suppose, uh, on average. But they, they vary in size and scale. We have six-week projects. We have six-month projects. It, it really comes down to someone's comfort, the pace someone wants to go at. Uh, we, a lot of our members have full-time jobs, they're full-time students or some raising kids and so on. And so a lot of what goes on is we are taking something that in some cases might have even been like an over, like a super ambitious game jam where people could just throw 48 hours a weekend at it, but they're in a phase of life where that doesn't really fit their schedule or like their responsibilities or their work need for sleep and so on. And so instead we've got a, a structure set up where anybody just chips in a few hours a week here or there when they can, it adds up over time. We've got various kind of processes to kind of keep it on the rails, but it's a, it's a big range and stuff, but it's all, like I say, slower paced than jams. Uh, but that also, I think, leaves us room to reflect, to learn, to to schedule time for me and my trainers if they're stuck on something, to get help before it comes up to the weekend, that kind of thing. You know, honestly, with game jams, I remember when I was first getting started, I, I wanted to go into the game development side of things, ended up being on the here on the front end side of things instead. Uh, but back then, I remember when game jams, there was only a few game jams going on and you would it'd be like the biggest things. And now I look at the like schedule for game jams and there's like 10 going on on any given day at a time. So many. So and I many. feel like especially in 2020 with, with people not being able to go out to conventions and stuff and show off their projects, I feel like we've gotten even more game jams starting up. Agreed. Yeah, it's uh, well. I think also folks are figuring out that depending, obviously, it varies by line of work and so on. But some people have figured out when they're working from home, it's easier to kind of fit in some side project stuff as long as the work's getting done. They're not on the boss's computer or whatever. They'll sneak in during lunch and other stuff. And yeah, I, I suspect you're right about that. Uh, James have had this very bizarre uh, sort of intersection point to when I say this pro approach kind of started for us 16 years ago, what began as a college club, but still going. But back then, people were impressed we made games in only like five months. We'd like finish a whole game in a semester and they're like, wow, that's so fast because jams were not very common yet. Uh, even by my second group that started at Georgia Tech in 2010, jams were common enough. People were like, wow, how do you stick to the same game for five months? How do you not get bored after 48 hours and want to go into the next thing? And 
yeah, it, the approach didn't change. The world changed around it. But it, it, it's a different set of strengths and weaknesses that I've also figured out. Folks who are very strong in jams that struggle with longer term projects or trying to figure out, okay, how do I plan something to not kind of put my whole world on hold while I'm doing it and then be able to pick it back up in pieces. And I don't know, out of, the, out of the many things we learned from making games, we learned programming stuff, we learned creative skills, we learned collaborative skills. I also like that planning is one of the skills we can pick up that I use the same stuff when I'm making one of my eBooks or when I'm doing something for my business. Same set of planning skills that we apply for these longer term games where it's, okay, how do a few hours here and there add up to something meaningful? I feel like that planning, especially the business planning and the being able to set out uh, your business goals is something also a lot of people getting into the creative field, getting into streaming, getting into YouTube and that sort of field definitely have a weak aspect to. Um, I'm, we talked about before, but I do a lot of stream coaching myself where I'm trying to teach people how to be better streamers. And one of the big things I always see across the board that people are really weak with is just that planning is like, okay, how am I going to, what am I, what are my goals that I'm doing in the long term? What are my goals for the short term? How I'm treat, how am I treating this as a business and not just as, um, something that I want to do to get attention and have fun. Cause a lot of people, if they're coming to me and wanting to improve their streaming setup, you're looking at taking this really seriously and not just as a hobby. And if you're doing that, we need to get you business plan and thinking of this as a business. We need to get you thinking as an entrepreneur, just uh, instead of just as a creative person. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of shifts in there. And I mean, like I said, there's, I think one of the things to forget, we obviously at a big enough company, different hats are worn by people who are hyper specialized. And, you know, we, we, we think of, okay, a game development team, and this happens all the time. We talk about the fourth four problem where, I uh, used to work electronic arts for a few years on console games. This was back in Wii era, Boom Blocks and Medal of Honor Airborne. And like the fourth floor is a bunch of people in suits who didn't work directly on the games, but they did a bunch of businessy stuff. And one of the things that would consistently see happen is a team of people from a AAA company would be like, okay, well, I'm a programmer and, and she's the she's audio person and we got a designer over here and we got a writer. We'll go start our indie thing. And they don't bring anyone with them from the fourth floor or someone who wears that hat of thinking about how does anyone know that we did this? Yeah. When's it gonna reach people? Or is there someone this is for? And, and and you know, obviously, if you're just building something, that's fine, and that's part of what we try to facilitate. Some people just want to make a game, make a game. I don't care who plays it or sees it. I just want to make stuff and get it out of me and learn things. Uh, but yeah, if you're trying to do something as a business, you very much someone's got to be at least half the time wearing that hat of justifying things and prioritizing. Yeah, project things managers, and, oh as God. boring as they are, can be are super important. And I've yeah. heard, I've I've heard and seen so many horror stories of people being taken advantage of by trying to like, but they have their program, their developer, their their um, designer, and then they don't have a marketer. And they come to a marketing company, and they just get absolutely taken for a ride, and they're paying so much money for what ends up being Google ads and nothing else. Like they're not doing anything, no, no, no influencer marketing, no campaigns or anything like that. They're just doing the bare minimum of, Hey, look, we made these graphics for you. We put them on Google ads and Facebook ads, and we're charging you too many zeros for that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's very much a layer of that. And, and it's, it's partly from, there's a, so well, there's a whole set of skills that, and we've got, so we got people working on the portfolios this month and home team that, when I, so I was a business minor in college, and I appreciated we had classes in resume writing, cover letter writing, doing a presentation. I was like, everyone needs those skills. Those are like life skills. Or even like our finance class, it was like some basic balance sheet stuff. I'm like, everybody should be shown how to do this. I, I don't care if it's what you're thinking. Like, you got bills. And I don't know. There, there's Likewise, it's this problem of how do we... Uh, uh, lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, sorry. Uh, Good. <laughs> What were you just saying a moment ago? Uh, okay, something, moment. something, projects. Projects, projects. Here, let me go uh, on my oh, yeah, tangent. No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, I got it. It's basically it's negotiating with, when you are when you have some other company who's doing the business side, they have business skills, which includes negotiation. They're like, negotiation is a skill that, it's like, well, I'm not a negotiator. I don't want to be a business person. You're going to do business with somebody who is, and they're going to negotiate better. Like, <laughs> you have to appreciate oh, yeah. that's a skill you're mastering for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, and again, like in the streaming side, there's a lot of people who they get into content creation thinking, I just want to make a creative thing and just have people enjoy it. 
and then I want to make money from that. And then whenever it comes down to like, how do I approach sponsors? How do I approach business partners? I'll bring on a manager and I just have the manager take care of all this. And I see the same thing where the managers that they're bringing on are also taking on for a ride. And I know about uh, companies that are that have come and gone that talking to game community managers, they refuse to work with anyone under the management company because they're so hard to work with. And I tell people, if you have a management company, you can't just let them take care of everything. You need to be in your email. You have to be watching who they're responding to and how they're responding to people because you want to make sure that whoever is representing you aren't burning bridges for you because that happens all the time. And they're like, I don't, I'm not a business person. I don't know how to handle it. It's like, if you're doing something that is very close to you, you are now a business owner. You are an entrepreneur. And that means you have to be wearing every single hat. Like if you want to just do one thing, then you need to go work at a company for somebody else. And then you can do that one thing because then it doesn't matter. But if this is your project, if you are the boss, that means you're wearing every single hat in the company. You might, this hat might fit better than that hat, but you have to be comfortable at least putting those on. So that way, whenever there's a conversation going on, you need to be a part of it. You need to be learning what's going on. So you don't find out that, well, I had this opportunity to work with this company that I love. And I've seen this exact thing happen where it's like, I really like this company. I reach out to them and I say, I want to work with them. And it's like, oh yeah, we reached out with you like two months ago. Uh, your manager said that you weren't interested. Oh. Uh, like, well, yeah. that's a shame. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's I, I my very first place I started selling some online resources and I still do this for some of the stuff is so Gumroad. It's a mm -hmm. site where it kind of basically plugs together. People can make a payment. They can get digital goods, videos, ebooks, audiobooks, whatever, just files, right? Money for files. That's a need you have. And so my first stuff, stuff I was selling was like example code and ebooks and stuff attached to it. And I got some like really negative online attack from somebody who was like, I read some bad things about an experience someone had on Gumroad. And I'm like, it's a, it's like you're mad at the cash register, but like. Like lots of people sell things on ground road. Your problem was whoever sold that thing. It's not the, the, the platform, but yeah, these, there's these weird branding effects of, like you say, they'll go through anyone at the company and well that you write off the whole thing. And we, we like intuitively, we have these same experiences of we'll meet one person who works at Microsoft or one person who works at Google or EA or Ubisoft or whatever and extrapolate because we're humans and be like, Oh, I can't get along with the, I would never work. Like there's 9,000 people there. There's zero chance. You're even going to run into that human being if you ever, but yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible that effect of, like you say, it's it. People will read into it, and so it's a constant thing where you know, I'm I'm always I, I don't police what people do outside of our <laughs> stuff, but I'm always curious as to like, okay, well, are they presenting themselves online the way it's not gonna make us look bad somehow? It's just a vague thing I'm have to be sensitive to because they are affiliated with us in varying degrees. It's like that, like when you go to people's Twitter account and says so and so tweets are my own, and who is that guy that? Uh, he had that hot take about um, game publishing and whether or not streamers and YouTubers need to have a, uh, a license in order to even play those games. And his bio said that he had, he worked for Stadia or was one of the lead people of Stadia. Ooh. And then it turns out that he doesn't even like, he wasn't even that involved with Stadia. That was just in his bio. Like, I know Twitter says tweets are my own, but in reality, that's not how the internet takes it at all. It's like, oh, yeah. you're the community manager for a so-and-so company? Let's burn that company to the ground. There is something also to be said for it, and I, I, just because I work with people on kind of all ends of spectrum of what they want out of doing things, which includes so freeware stuff. And so a lot of people are making games. Some people I have where I work with who build freeware have a day job in industry at some bigger company with a licensed IP that... You know, there's certain ways they have to do that business. There's certain trade-offs that they make as virtue of, well, someone else is paying for this. I have to be answerable to customers. I have to be answerable to my online persona. I have to be answerable to et cetera. Versus in their other freeware stuff, anything goes. They just do the thing they feel like doing. They don't have to justify it. They don't have the case for it. Obviously, it's a different scale. Mm -hmm. They're not able to invest. No one's taking their savings and dumping, you know, a whole bunch of figures into it. But it's it's a very different thing people get out of it when they do or don't and so I because you said earlier like you know some people want to stream just whatever they feel like and make money doing it and there's a there's a balancing scale in there of they are making certain trade-offs too if i want to wear that professional hat and i want this to be what i'm paid for um there that will come with some you know some trade-offs as to maybe what they cover or how they cover it or or needing to take more feedback even if at times it disagrees with i suspect what they might just be in the mood to do but maybe there's not an audience for that, or maybe that's not what people are receptive to, or that kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's funny to think of like 
what I, what you want to do in the audience. It's something I talk to a lot of people about. Is that whenever are, are you familiar with ikigai, the Japanese idea, idea of ikigai? Uh, I th- I feel like I re- think I recognize this about, but if you'll describe it first, it'll remind me, and I'll be like, yes, that's it, or I'll be like, no, I was totally thinking the wrong thing. So it's it's been it's been changed a little bit, but it still it still applies. It's a idea where there are four things that in a profession that you can do there's what you love to do what you can be paid for what the world needs and what you're good at and if you can find a center of all four things if you find something that hits all those four check marks that's your like true calling that's your your reason for being that's your ikigai um but you can always find something that you're doing that fulfills several of those uh areas so if you have something that you love and that you're good at but it's not something you can get paid for it's not something the world needs that's a passion project that's something that you're doing that you enjoy but nobody cares about it and no one's going to give you money for it you're just doing that because you like it and you're good at it and on the opposite side if there's something that the world needs and that you can be paid for but you don't like doing it uh, maybe you're not that good. That's a vocation. So that's the job that you do so that way you have time to work on your passion. So maybe that's what your two things are you, you're doing are. Maybe you don't have something that fulfills all four, but you have that day job and then you have that hobby. And those two are feeling like different halves of the Ikigai for you. Yeah. And so yeah, when, yeah. when you're like, when you're thinking about like online content, it's like maybe you're having trouble growing because you're focusing too much on things that the world doesn't need. And so what can you do that fulfills some of that? Maybe there's some overlap with things that you like and things that the world needs. And maybe there's overlap between that and something you're, you're good at. Is there something in that section? Uh, can you refocus or realign content that you're doing so that way it helps fill more things? Maybe that means a format change. Maybe that means a niche change. But how can we think about, especially in the online content creation space and uh, anytime you're doing a product, is is someone else making something similar to this? Which is, does the world need this? Because if someone else is already making something that's the same thing, well, maybe the world doesn't need it, but maybe you can bring it to a new, uh, a new sector, a new, a new game, a new niche, a new genre. Yeah, a, a, a major, com- a, a sizable component of my business and funnel stuff is I've got video courses on Udemy, uh, codeyourfirstgame.com and how to program games and stuff. And those are 300,000 students. I'm proud to say after several years of that stuff. And with Udemy, with their instructors, they're always trying to stress just because somebody else has made a course about JavaScript or Unity or making an ebook or whatever the topic is, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Absolutely. It means there's people who want to learn that. And there's sort of this effect of, okay, well, somebody wants the version that's a little more intense. Someone's one's a little more gentle. Someone's one that's a little bit more, you know, just a different angle on it or like the version of it that's more free form or whatever. And it's, they, I think they even use an example to call it like the mattress store effect of how does a store, how does a city have so many different stores and mattresses? <laughs> uh, and it's because one of those stores is real pushy on the sale. They just want you in and out of there. Some customers want that. Some of them take their time and aren't going to even try to tell you the price and they just want you to sell yourself. And that's what some people want. And it's just basically personality styles of people that I want mattresses from people who are certain way and they shop around town until they find the one that they buy the basically the same mattress in the same factory regardless at the same price <laughs> but there's this effect of yeah people people want things in a different way and and as a, some of my research stuff was in pinball same thing of like it's pretty similar mechanics and a lot of tables but someone wants to pirate one someone wants to casino one and someone wants the underwater one and that's that's not like a bad thing that's helping more people find something that they resonate with that relates to them that connects to what they need they want that same course topic thing etc but on the angle of well, I, w- I want to do mine about yoga or I want to do mine yeah. about, you know, strategy games or whatever. I find myself pushing people in opposite directions on this same topic a lot of different times. I find myself pushing people like, OK, I-, I see what you're doing, but I really need you to try to niche it down. Like you you have an idea, but it is f- way too generic. I really need you to try to niche it down and push it into a smaller market. And then there is the other people who are the, the other half of everybody is. I, I want to do this, but there's already somebody making it. And I have to convince those that like, well, you're not the one who's made that. And if they're making it, that means, and they're finding success, that means people want it. And so this that you're thinking of is niche enough that 
You just need to be doing it so that way your hand in making it adds uniqueness and your own personality to that product. It's just like music you know there might be that same this the same song but when you're playing it you're bringing a little bit of style a little bit of flair a little bit a little bit of your unique personality to it that makes it a little bit different there's a lot of times people have played every single beethoven and chopin song and now it's yours that you're doing the cover of it and then at the same time how do i how do i find how do i best let people know where that good evenness is, where we can't have you doing, copying somebody, doing the exact same thing, but how do I get you to try something that someone else is finding success in, but making it your own? Yeah, this comes up a ton in game development stuff, where for basically at the learning layer, and I don't encourage this for the business layer, but for the learning layer, there's a decent amount of exactly what you call covers and songs of, I made my version of Asteroids, I made my version of Match 3, I made my version of whatever, where inevitably you're going to make something different because you have different opinions and thoughts and attitudes and whatever than whoever else has made these things. Yours comes out a bit different, but it puts you in a situation to start answering both a mixture of real questions of what power-ups are good in a racing game, which is not, it's a hard question to answer until you have working racing mechanics. And on the other side to start looking at, okay, well, I have to actually figure out how did they do that thing? Uh, and I can't just wiggle my way out of, I did the easy thing. And I said, that's how it's supposed to be. I got to be like, ah, how they had destroyable terrain. How do they do that? I've got to find a way to do that. And it's just this nice balance of putting myself in a situation to, to put my personal flavor and touch and spin on it, but having enough of a foundation that I'm not just out in left field trying to reinvent what are games, what is music, and there's room for that, but it's a hard place to start because they don't know enough of the kind of rules to, to break mm -hmm. with intentionality or coherently and that kind of thing. Yeah. How many different Flappy Birds and Pongs and Tetrises are there that everyone's made and put a different character or flavor or power up in and it's a good thing it's part of it's a part of the learning layer i'm, yeah. I'm glad to see that stuff happening yeah yeah it's, it's like if people were like oh you shouldn't solve this math problem someone else has solved it all the math courses go away we can't just start you at the phd like rocket ship problem uh, you gotta do some stuff that we know the answers to first to figure out how you do it so to take this to uh art um a lot of people ask i i get i see my wife get asked this question a lot it's like man how do you get so good at art and there's this weird disconnect when you're doing something creative that people don't think about when you see something that people are doing that is more handsy like if you if you think of a foot if i ask you to think of a football player or a sports athlete you're like well how often do you think they're practicing on the field how often do you think they're exercising how often do you think they're playing their game like if i think of a football player you expect them to be playing football basically the entire season People don't assume that that sort of skill, uh, practice, and diligence applies to creatives. Like, how do you get good at art? It's like, well, I've just been drawing every day, nonstop. Like, I just, I just draw more. It's like, well, how do I get good? It's like, you need to just be doing these things. And that process and that very dedicated practice to a craft is really important. But people just don't see that in the creative field. And people assume that I will, if I read enough or learn enough start and be good at it i'll just open yep. up i'll begin and my the first time i make something it's beautiful if i learn yeah. enough yeah there uh, there's a dual effect in there and i see the same thing all the time for game development stuff people starting out where they like oh i've been watching videos about it for years i've been reading about it for years i haven't so much done anything and i'm like well, okay well then we're basically we're starting at step one realistically the rest of that you're immediately going to figure out you're not in a position to use because you're not in that in that kind of level and yeah it's just uh people i don't know it's like you can't just read your way into doing gymnastics or into doing a variety of other stuff like you got to start doing it you make some mistakes you learn from your own lessons of your own hindsight and i like to think of the wincing effect of and maybe there's an analogy in art where you'll draw something and look at it and be like well that's not right uh, <laughs> but it's gonna be very particular to you and the ways that yours isn't right in a way that you can start to grow from in a way that you're not going to tell looking at somebody else's stuff you might get some inspiration you might get some neat ideas but you got to do something with it to start really getting those those craft skills and yeah the practice time adds up makes up just the other day is literally kind of last day of 2020 i just shuttered my hobby game dev blog which for like five i or six saw years, you made a, a post on that i was writing an article every week for like five years uh on game development stuff and like that became eventually a foundation for one of my first ebooks for some of my course material for other stuff 
and I, it was like just putting in the time alongside some of that was in grad school some of them was doing indie games some of them was doing bigger company stuff different phases of life just kept practicing writing articulating these ideas because once i got them out of me i could look at it and be some of like there's something there there's more i can i can take that I can run with it, i can build something around that and lots of it no but i couldn't tell until i got it out of me to look at it and be like eh, that didn't have legs eh, that one didn't really work so good um and, and i had next to no audience for that blog for a number of years eventually it blew up but for a long time it was just me kind of talking to myself just trying things seeing what would stick seeing what i could say and yeah that's 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 kind of be part of the process but obviously by the time something takes off people don't see that stuff and they're just like oh i came out of nowhere uh, overnight success person just could draw could dance sang a song and now they're on top of youtube and like no that's that's kind of never the case <laughs> there's, there's that success paradox and all all the entrepreneurs you hear always love to say about like uh fail fast and that involves the first step is doing something to allow yourself to fail because it's so much easier to try something and then see what you did wrong and then make those iterative improvements to it than to try to make it right the first time because you're never going to make things right the first time and keep things small in scope make things make projects that you can finish and be not maybe not happy with but be able to look at yourself and say that project's done. I'm shuttering that project. I can move on to the next one. And don't let don't let scope creep just come on. You just like oh, I just want to like do it. I'll add more to this and make it better. And I'll just add more to this and make it better. I'll add more and then just just shutter it and move on to the next project. And that can be really helpful, like mentally especially. Yeah, in one of those early college clubs, they made a they made a project that was sort of inspired by Smash Brothers. Pretty ambitious for a college hobbyist amateur side thing. Didn't come out great. They threw another semester at it. Still didn't come out great. They threw a third semester at it. No better than it really was at the end of the first semester. Should have just put it in a box, put a bow on it, move on to the next project lessons learned. There were some deep-rooted fundamental problems that, and like, with, with no blame, they're beginners. Making beginner mistakes, that's what you do. And I've tried to help people think about it rather than like, oh, what if I'm bad at it? It's like, you're brand new. You're going to be bad at it. Expect that. Th th there's no way through that besides through it. Yeah. Um, it's like, well, if I don't, if I pick up a guitar and I'm not selling out seats in the stadium, why even bother? It's like, no, it's going to sound terrible for a while. That's the experience. That is it. Um, anybody who's not doing that, has they annoy their neighbors for a while. Like that's. And that's, people don't that's, remember that's your failures. <laughs> people don't remember where yeah. you started. People never go back and look through your history. And it's like, oh my God, that successful artist. Did you, have you seen what they made two years ago? And you're going to be sketches. your your own harshest critic. Every creative is their own harshest critic. Like, I talk to everybody, and they're going, oh, that piece from four months ago? What a hack. I didn't know anything back then. My new stuff is so much better. And it's just constant. It's like, past me was a, was a washed up wannabe who just thinks that they knew stuff. But now, now my eyes are open, and I really know what I'm doing. Yeah, it's a sign of progress to, to look back at your old stuff with a little bit of shame. To just be like, well... <laughs> To, to, to see now what you didn't then. And now, obviously, I think there's also an element of fooling ourselves of like, huh, I'm finally done growing and, and know it all now. And uh, obviously, two years from now, you look back at the same thing like, I would a mess. What a disaster. What an embarrassment. <laughs> uh, and you, you, like, you hope that's the case. You want to keep making that progress. So you look back at your other stuff and be like, ah, oh, uh, come on, me. But that's, that's, that's the game. <laughs> Chris, do you have anything that you can show us right now a project that you've been working on. I've got something I'm going to grab over here. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just uh, do a little screen rearrange stuff. stuff. Um, first one I was going to share. And actually, should I just screen share on Zoom? Is that going to work best for how we're wired together? Uh, sure, let's go for that. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's see. Let's, let's see what we can do. Let's, let's find let's out. Let's try out what happens. Let me share my whole desktop on your uh, Twitch and see how this goes. Uh, is this coming through here? We got some stuff. Right. I think Look, I'm going gonna, gonna to do this and we're going to slide over here and you're going to be... Rangy. Uh, your Your webcam's going to be a part of the screen, but but we can see. There we go. Okay, so, uh, so basically one of our most recent home team projects was I was just recently finalizing virtual reality updates on. And so this is a project I led. For the most part, most of our projects are led by members. Every now and then I lead one because that's part of the fun too. I try to be a kind of a role model for how I do stuff and plan things. People kind of see my attitude about it, but uh, often it's creating a situation people want to practice and have fun in. And so this was our prototype when we first pitched it. And the idea was you've got this rail gun and it causes chain reactions and you can control time to and fro. So you're kind of like scrubbing through 
time. You can kind of picture these invisible roller coasters that these spacecraft are on. And you shoot one, it causes these chain reactions. You get bonus points for more hits through it. And when we pitched it, that was the state of the prototype. I had this idea of like, oh, it's going to be in a city. It'll be kind of like the epic battle in, you know, a Marvel movie or whatever. And then we just recently got it. The game came out. It works fully in browser. But we've also been adding some final touches for VR. And so, you know, we got our little left hand. We got a zoom scope on the right side. And it's just something that was a lot of fun to kind of do because I've got a quest. And it's just so neat being able to take things that work fine, play fine on a screen, and then start to explore how do we make that look different, feel different, navigate into VR space. And I had not too long ago solved some different VR problems for a different home team game. Unity's process around these things have changed. Their plugins you do the stuff have changed. And it gave me an excuse and a reason to have a practical benefit to I'm going to solve this problem. And then that payoff of when I solved it, I've got something to show for it. Uh, also, just as a kind of design human being, running these challenges of how do I kind of convey and adapt stuff that worked on a flat screen into VR. We have these cinematic sequences when the game plays in WebGL, just in browser on a flat screen that's like a stories thing every time you start a level and we couldn't figure out how to get that to work decent in a vr space so i put it on a little ipad in your left hand <laughs> was a solution we just added the past week so you see it down here and then also it turns into your high score display and it gives you this little comfortable readout and just helps you feel situated i'm holding my ui instead of it didn't look good with a number floating up here it didn't look good with a wall yeah. of text moving in front of you and so then yeah it's just been been a lot of fun this is somewhere you know we had people for i think probably dozen 15 16 people maybe chipping in different models and and because basically every time i lead a project when i'm doing stuff i'm kind of figuring out okay what's something that's going to create a lot of opportunities for people to practice whatever the heck they feel like because of the time canon part of our story is like oh the time aliens screwed up the timelines so there's world war ii planes and world war one planes and there's aircraft carriers and there's just stuff from different eras cold war submarines uh spacecraft in there and it was an excuse to just model, and every week we'd just be like, hey, is there a ship, a craft, a vehicle, a type of building, a structure, whatever you want to build and model and get it in the game? And that was very much what we did. And, I, uh, you know, just very pleased with how it kind of came together. And then for some people, it was a chance to do some visual effects. Let me just real quick pull up here our show that kind of story sequence in contrast, mm -hmm. not on the uh, in-game iPad experience. And you can very, like I say, it's much more standard cinema display. And then part of the, the kind of the idea, too, is that each stage in time has a different type of uh, part of history. And so this is like before the city was built, we played a, a, a prehistory version of that stage where the space aliens are fighting it out. And so each one of our stages has different eras throughout history where we took that same stage. And this is kind of a fun experiment in solving how to do this, where we've actually only authored four scenes mm -hmm. and we've tagged things in those scenes to be like this one shows up from this interval after which the city collapsed. Gotcha. These weren't built until this year, this era. And that allowed us also have some kind of tuning, some experiences. Okay, some levels are a little more precision and puzzly. Some levels are just more chaotic. Uh, and then we have also have a chaos dimension. We have a guy named Chris Sterner Group. He's a mentor from Canada who works with us and helps our developers. And he just wanted to do something kind of surreal. <laughs> and this is also something that was like a lot of fun. And Jeremiah helped with the, the level design. We got an elephant here from, from Mohammed over in Germany. And this is something that I would not have thought of. I think it makes the game a lot more charming. And in VR, this is super cool. This is just like extra surreal when you've got these kind of bright lights around you and stuff. And again, because we've got the time dilation effect and the reversibility, what's happening, of course, I'm kind of lining up my shots, but it's the same strategy. And it, it just doesn't take itself too seriously. It's kind of hand waving from the beginning of, eh, it's an arcade game. It's silly. It's for fun. And that's often what I'm doing too. Or sometimes you have people who pitch games that are very narrative or very serious. And it can be harder in those to have the same flexibility. But I like to try to pitch the stuff where one of my favorite examples, we did a game that was like you're in a balloon flying over zombies or something. And some guy just added a tornado without even talking to anybody else about it. Did the art, <laughs> did the code for it, did the sound for it. Tornado's in the game now, in a hot air balloon game. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> um, I love these things where you just wake up and your game is not only better, but weirder. And it just kind of, to me, it's a big morale boost where part of why I pitch things is because it's just more fun and it's just more like, motivating to just occasionally your game just gets cooler and neater and better in a way that you weren't a part of a meeting on. You didn't have to stress about it and think about uh, just people chipping in, being creative together. It's fun. It's kind of like one of those uh, exquisite corpse things where people kind of draw a picture, fold the page, complete the picture, Which fold that, the page. Which that is a, a neat little game, exquisite corpse. Uh, one of my oh, favorite yeah. things with VR and seeing VR right now is just watching 
controls and what menus, UI, diegetic, non diegetic UI elements work, and just watching that evolve. I think of when I was a kid and just seeing the effects of controllers and people figure out how controllers and one thumbstick, two thumbstick cameras, you use your the D-pad to move and the thumbstick to move your camera. That's just what's going to happen. And just seeing these weird experiments in controllers and then seeing that same thing now that I'm older with VR controls. A like, yeah, so Ape Escape first... is the exact game I'm thinking of where the D-pad is how you moved your character and then... The no D pad is how you moved your camera, and the thumbsticks were your character's actions. There, there was a uh, I think Alien, not Alien Isolation, one of the old Aliens, like PlayStation One or something, with has sold for a version of the early Dual Shock, pre even I might I think it was pre PS Two. Basically, one of the first games that had this one stick to look and move, one stick to <laughs> aim or whatever. And the reviewer was like, that's one of the scariest things about it, how disorienting <laughs> and complex it is to do this, because people weren't used to that yet. They weren't established that was the convention of what to do. And yeah, it's a very kind of Wild West experience again of lots of things being reinvented, lots of things being experimented, certain games are finding certain niche interactions. It's like one of my favorite VR games, Saints and Sinners. I played a lot of that, but in certain games, you pull a thing off your back. And if you're in room scale with a certain type of device, that works. If you're using a Quest as a linked device, Quest partly tracks your hands by being in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. And so certain mechanisms and mechanics and motions that work fine for PSVR are actually really problematic of unless you're looking at your hip, it's really hard to draw a knife or a gun off of it. Uh, and the same thing also happens for the opposite for aiming a gun, which is bizarre because like how often are you aiming a gun in VR? Pretty much many of the games are doing that. PSVR is terrible at that because you're holding a glowing orb in front of a glowing headset in front of the camera and it doesn't have a good angle and it yeah. makes it jumpy and jiggly. Whereas in Oculus Quest, if you're using that as Link, because again, you're it's just so rock solid. And you get these bizarre challenges as a designer for if I'm trying to make this support multiple headsets, I'm having to work. It's just like that Venn diagram of, you know, what do I feel like making what I want to buy? But it's, <laughs> okay, what's going to work on Quest? What's going to work on Steam Linked HTC? What's going to work on some other PSVR's constraints? And we get these games that work great on one and not on other for reasons that are like, structural physical in how the devices are interpreting the space uh but yeah it's it, it, even that so trying to make this game it's important to us that people who are don't have vr can can work on can play can show in the portfolio of these games making the same game also work for both non-vr and vr likewise you're playing that venn diagram game of you've got kind of a denominator for certain things in the experience that might be cool only in vr aren't going to translate yeah. to a flat screen experience and vice versa all right, Chris, I'll have you uh, close your screen share so I can get you back to you the it. same size as before so I don't have to change my layout. Sure. Stop share. All right, cool. Boom. I'm back. And then now let's go take a look at – oh, wait, wait. I have I have my turn first. I have I have the thing that I want to share first before yeah. we get over to that. Oh, no, what happened to you? Where would you go? You disappeared on me. Come on. Oh, no. Be good. Let's swap over to here and then swap <laughs> things back. And then we get to see you again. Excellent. <clears throat> hey, it's a me. So uh, all these all these panels behind me are something new that I set up during this stream last week. So I have a whole new back uh, audio panel set up. And now there's actually two colors back there. I showed this setup to my wife and she's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, it's very busy. I'm like, well... Yeah, that's just how it's going to be for a while because I don't have enough to fill up the whole wall and I just wanted to throw the extra panels up there somewhere. So that's that mess is just what it's going to look like. I think it's a good look. And last night, <sighs> made this. So I have this colorful wheel. We have a little uh, us sticker on the center of it. So it's got my name on it. All these dowel rods I had to uh, glue on and see how flimsy they'd stay. Uh, but it's actually it's, it works really well so i now have a spinning wheel so you know write things on it so when we get subs and donos we can say hey you got banned for five minutes congratulations you win <laughs> thanks for the sub that's uh, awesome but it's also not actually weighted properly because there's some bolts on here when i got this and the bolts are not evenly spaced so it's slightly heavier on the on one side than it is in the other. 
And so I have a few screws over here that I'm just going to start taping to it so I can see if I can balance out the weight of it and have it be a little bit more fair. Otherwise, it's, it's I'm just going to put like all these as like you get banned and then like down here is like you win a thousand dollars and they'll just never show up. Nice. Yeah, that's I mean, it's it's just what a fun exercise. This puzzle you've set up for yourself to try to have to figure out, I don't know, that this it's going to be a nice reward when you get it closer and closer to probability. This reminds me, too, of, you know Magic 8-Balls? Yes. Right? Yeah. Do, you know what's Do I know Magic 8-Balls? That's like a, well, that's but, like a, but, a question, and how old but, are you? But, 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 well, so, but here, I, old, old. But, so, but here's the, uh, older than I look. But, so, here's the, the quiz question. Do you know what the proportion of answers is on it for yes, no, and maybe? No, I don't. It is twice as likely to give you a positive answer as a negative or a maybe. Hmm. It's 10 yeses, 5 maybes, 5 negatives. And so because of that, you act, you can ask it stacked questions with a two-third chance of getting a better than uh, negative answer. And so, you know, you could use your weighted wheel and then specifically score it accordingly as to where <laughs> you place your five-minute bands and your giving away Xboxes. Um, you're not as regulated as Las Vegas. Yeah, look, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I never actually give anything away, then I never have to worry about taxes, right? Like, if I don't That's give true. people money... Simple that nobody will ever know that's true all right I'll this yeah. this looks like i've accidentally shown my own screen but this is actually here actually, oh wait that's right i asked, asked to make one that doesn't mirror repeat universe. down into a universe for themselves so this is uh little asso's new streaming setup that they're making uh and it's very colorful <laughs> it's super <laughs> colorful i i think what they're doing also is they're actually putting a capture of their screen as a scrolling background behind what's going on if you can see that yeah that's slick that i think works well for now but i think whenever you start getting into if you start doing games and not something that's a screen capture like art i know they're going to be doing a lot of art on screen but once you get something else in there i think it might repeat too much and do that infinite mirror looking thing that may or may not work out well but I like a, I like the colors yeah. especially. I think the colors in the pastels are really really cute. I, I think we got a good point there. It, it, it's a good contrast to if the activity on the screen is relatively slow paced or, or a little more static, obviously alive, but not as FPS jumping, spinning, whatever. Then yeah, this helps balance out that energy in a way that might be too much if it was streaming gameplay or something on top of it doing the same effect. And this one here is another screen with chat on it. I like it. I think the motion in chat is too much. I think chat's moving, the, the scrolling background in chat's a little bit too much. It draws too much of your eye to that portion of it. Could be slowed down and toned down uh, a touch. I feel you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically my first reaction was, oh, I like that. And then it was like, I might like that too much. Mm -hmm. now, now just, I'm only looking at that. <laughs> yeah, how much... Uh, how, how heavily things are weighted is something I'm always concerned about when we're looking at streams. It's which elements on the stream are taking my focus, which elements on the stream are uh, my eyes going to be drawn to. And ideally, parts of that are your webcam. ASO doesn't have a webcam on. If you're getting into streaming and online content creation, I cannot stress how important having some representation of you is. Because nowadays, there are so many people doing online content creation that it's really hard to make a personal connection with somebody if you don't get to see them. If you don't see how they look and don't see how they, well, you get to hear how they sound, but you don't see their expressions and their emotions when they're doing stuff, it's hard to make that personal connection with somebody. And if you are insecure about how you look, and you think the internet's gonna make fun of you, just know that they will make fun of you no matter how good looking you are. Like, no matter how beautiful or handsome or good looking you are, somebody's going to manage to put a comment that is that one little tiny thing that you're insecure about. It's like, oh my God, did you see how their ears are like three inches off their head? And you're like, no, not my ears. They found it, they found my one weakness. Someone is going to find that thing and they're going to point it out. And you just have to rip the Band-Aid off. But if you don't want to put yourself out there that much, right now, VTubers are blowing up. So you could be a VTuber and have that digital avatar of yourself be you. That's that's another option right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, basically 100%. Every now and then I used to do some videos where I wasn't on camera for YouTube and I was just be like, here's how to fix a thing in Unity. And one of the problems I ran into is someone who watches that video is basically no more likely to ever watch any of my videos ever again, right? They're just going to search the internet for some random answer to their Unity question from whoever versus if they see me again in a corner, they're like, oh, it's that person. I learned that other thing from it. Start to make that thread connection between it. It's just such a, a human thing. And like you say, no matter, I mean, people online obviously like rip on famously attractive <laughs> Hollywood actors and actresses. That's what they yeah. do on the internet. And if anything, occasionally people are like, find it a little more relatable when someone's like, Seth Rogen's built like a human being. That's kind of makes him more like me. Uh, it's, it's not a bad thing. I, I love the celebrity reads me <laughs> tweets about them. Uh, I don't remember what show had it on SNL, whatever it is. But so it's celebrity meets, reads me tweets about that. I was like, oh man, it's something feels good about it. I mean, all I get are just like Asian jokes. So like nobody's <laughs> creative about me. And like, come on, I've been, I, I want some of that creativity. I want, I want some, something new. Yeah. Yeah. Part, part of what my, my facial hair is relatively recent addition to my look, partly because without it, I look like I'm 19, maybe 26 tops. <laughs> which has had some downsides off some viral videos like oh wait until it gets older i'm like i'm already there this is peak me i don't know what to tell you uh this is <laughs> but yeah it's it's interesting and also we got some, it's a proportion thing where there's this old point from the business motivation sphere of the internet of like if you have haters you want to get 10 times as many because it's proportional to your audience size and my my viral videos that have like say 7 million views in one case or whatever that's a thing where like okay if one in a million people are just really awful angry trollish human beings like one in a million, I got seven of them in there. And and the oh, like to increase my audience size, there's gonna be eight and then nine, hopefully. And that's the game of the internet. It doesn't even it's not even about you at some point. It's because they woke up on the wrong side of the bed, it's because they had a crummy day, it's because they're <laughs> expressing their own insecurity and they're they're projecting it onto you. And that's that's the that's the wild public. And you know, what are you gonna do besides kind of build that separation of like, ah, oh, this they don't know me. They don't know it's not a reflection of anything about you as a person, you know. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Here's another, here's a art piece of um, King in a House. I believe it's King one Hill? of the, no, it's, it's a big, no? big anime. It's, it's oh, a I really f famous. <laughs> uh, and Inner, Inner Demon's looking to update this digitally. So that'll be, that'll be fun to see progress. We get to see that again later. And here's from Tentacle Honey. His lovely name, Tentacle Honey, is working on this piece from a game that we've been playing, Genshin Impact, making some cute artwork. Not the one in the upper left, that's just a character. The one bottom right is the one that we were working on, so that looks great. We got to see some of their stickers last time around from their characters, and so, like, all around good work from, from Tentacle. Skilled. Uh, my brother made this, which is uh, just the, he, he broke his monitor. But that's it's making something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lunar Spy. I we're, we're going through these a little fast, but just want to hit these before we run out of time here for what we have scheduled for today. Lunar Spy is a disgusting furry, and here's his degenerate furry creatures. Uh, oops, didn't even want to go to that screen. Uh, one with eyes shown and one without eyes shown. Did he say this is an OC? I think this is, I think this is an OC. Yes. Yes, it is. Cool. I, Chris, what, what, what animal is this? Animal. Oh no. I feel hesitant to guess. Am I, is that a horn from one side of the head? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say. You're not gonna give me any information. I also don't uh, know for sure. So I don't know if it's a horn. But I want to know your guess on what what animal this is. I I am I am honestly reluctant to guess. I am not familiar with the conventions around this. Uh, I think it looks like an espion. I not espion in a, um, uh, an absol. Yeah, I think it looks like an absol. I this also feels like my 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 vocabulary for animals is not as good. <laughs> it is definitely I'm, I'm not animals. I'm literally Googling Pokemon. like what is absol. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, now that I've Googled that, I'm mm. like, yeah, that you got it. That makes sense. I think me. that is a, a thick absol, I think is what it is. <laughs> have to see if we can get a confirmation on that later. <laughs> uh, but I, I do know Lunar Spy. Lunar Spy, we actually met them in person a few times. My wife's made a uh, fan art for one of their other characters, one of their other OCs. 
I know they're they're deep into furry, and look that that was a and furries are a mistake. <laughs> I I take no position. <laughs> Here is Edgy's web comic that you're. It's, did you say web comic that you're working on? Uh, yeah, web comic. Yeah. So Edgy, I know you're here. Edgy, tell us a little bit about this project that you're working on here. It looks like, Chris. What is it? What does this look like to you, Chris? Tell me the summary of this web comic. Let's see. Okay, well, it's cutting live to a show, and then there's a creature on the show. Then they shift frame. I'm going, you know, left. Basically, I'm looking at left side, top to bottom, and then middle. So we zoomed in. As far as what's going on this dialogue, uh, workaholic, and then. I don't know. I, I'm not totally following the third, the rightmost panel as to what's going on. But also, like, I don't know, as, as storyboarding to me, it's it's sketches to ourselves sometimes. It's jogging my memory of, like, as long as I know what that is, as the person mm -hmm. who's doing that as a process step, all the time I'll jot things in my notes that'll make no sense to anybody, but it's enough to give me that hook so I don't lose the thread on, I know where I'm going with it. So, I don't know. I, I Again, I, I think I follow the first panel or two, at least I'm guessing I am, uh, that third right side I'm having a harder time keeping up with uh, or figuring out from context without more context what that is so here's the one thing I want to ask I edgy is this a jackalope is that the species jackalope because I think it is um, it looks like they're a live streaming jackalope that's what I'm gonna that's that's where I'm putting my money on this is this is a live stream uh, a youtubing Twitch streaming jackalope. And here's what I see as Floraverse jackalopes. I am not familiar with what a Floraverse is. Huh. My, me either. I'm learning all kinds of things today. I'm not going to Google anything that's furry on stream just, just mm. to be safe. Fair. Good call. <laughs> and here's the here's the cover of the webcomic which I will say it looks like you're doing are is this going to be a vertical scroll comic that you're going to be doing or is this made to be um like comic book style or webcomic horiz what I'll call webcomic horizontal I'm not sure in the uh the format cuz this looks like this is going to be vertical scroll going from what you've paneled 1 2 3 this girl is named Peck Fret. She's a workaholic who's got an identity crisis and tries to tackle that in her life. That is a weird name. I actually thought this said Pedro, not Peck Fret. But all right. Nice. I think that's a, a great and important theme. I dig. And... The last submission we have here is a continuation of my brother's setup of his going to be audio studio uh, recording, audio recording setup. Uh, as someone else pointed out, there is a lovely bottle of lotion and tissues on the table. Mm -hmm. Very moisturized with no sniffling. It's going to yeah. help avoid background sounds. On uh, I'm going to say that He's definitely being a troll because my brother is not left-handed. His mouse is on the left side of his keyboard. So I think that is a very purposefully put yes. Like, <laughs> your mouse is on the left side. Hmm. I know you're right-handed. So, so, sometimes, sometimes we uh, can engage things virally by, by causing some commotion, getting people's attention. <laughs> uh, it's sometimes a strategic maneuver. Of uh, leaving an error in there, it's a it's a classic brain hack. To I I've got to say something when I see that, gets us the algorithm. Numbers. That reminds me of those like old <laughs> posters they like to share. It's like oh they purposely threw drew like a third leg on this girl in a swing. So that way your brain knows something's wrong, but you can't try place it right away. Like I don't know if I, that's true, but I, I don't know, I mean, yeah, there's there's a range. Some of it's uh, uh, like. I don't know. I don't know if you ever see this. There's, there's some internet ads people will put in your feed or whatever, where they'll, they'll intentionally just screw up the kerning. In some way <laughs> oh that, my like, god! But, here, a... but how many people know kerning? I well, but no, here's the point. I hate even, it. Uh, like, even if you're not a designer, or typographer, or font expert, you just look at it and your brain double takes and be like, "That ain't right." But that's long enough. Now you've read the message. 
and now they got one more they got one more look than they would have got otherwise and that's really what they're in it for that judging by of- how many people <laughs> i've talked to and had to complain about their current and complain about fonts and stuff is like i don't i don't think the general non-font nerds geek out about these things and i know i do sometimes i'll geek out i was like oh i know that font oh i definitely recognize that font I, totally possible i'm also reminded so i used to live in atlanta there's a coca-cola museum and there's a whole exhibit around the new coke phenomenon where they did this thing people reveled they wanted the old coke back and people accused them and were like hey did you just make up this thing we hated to get us to promote your thing you like and their answer was like we are neither that dumb <laughs> nor that smart you're giving us too much credit we made a mistake we made the best of it and that's that's the whole story what about uh, but yeah, left think... twix versus right twix what you don't know what you didn't that? see that like brand push for a little while they were like no. these these ads and they're all out there is like what, what do you prefer left twix or right twix and <laughs> it's twix it's the exact same but they were just making this like a or B team, Mac versus PC, it was just left Twix or right Twix. <laughs> what do you like? I'm like, oh, you guys are devious. This also reminds me, there was some, I was just reading some other material on sales copy stuff, and one was about, like, it was this old survey, and it was like, okay, what do you think is the biggest problem in your tennis game as a player? It was like, is it the serve? Is it the whatever? And no matter which answer you gave, it still fed them back to, like, you need to buy this video thing that we sell. <laughs> and it answers, but, like, obviously they positioned the pitch differently, but the answer and all led back to the same. as like, do you like left or right Twitch? Is already setting up like you're eating a Twix, right? They they got you. Uh, <laughs> Which like we that. also like to call uh, lazy visual novel design. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Chris, thank you so much for being on our show. I know this has uh, been a little experiment. I'm glad that I t- I'm so glad to have you on. It's good to see you again. Hope you've been doing well lately. It was uh, as we're all stuck at home and maybe maybe what what how, what are your hopes for conventions in 2021 what are your hopes for conventions this year what do you think i so here's the, so i like i said i've been involved with the indicate for a long time actually since 07 and then organizers in like 2014 whatever and this year was our first one online and i tend to be a proponent of online as advantageous obviously i run a fully online business i organize groups that are online etc i uh, I'm optimistic vaccines will become available. I'm optimistic people and businesses that depend on in-person things can get their streams and functions all back together. That said, I I tend to be a silver lining person too. And while things are still online, a lot of folks who otherwise couldn't take the vacation days, couldn't travel in or out of the United States or even to a different city and afford a hotel somewhere, et cetera, have been able to network better, find more things kind of firsthand live. And so, I don't know, I'm I'm silver lining i'm looking at the best for while things are having to happen online find the benefits of that uh and then once things can and do safely go back to in person we'll be pleased and we'll be happy about that but in the meantime i'm i'm grateful for the opportunities of supporting some people who otherwise never got a chance to go to gdc until it was online or siege until it was online or packs and those kind of things i'm hoping to get things in fall i know conventions are going to be happening again we had a convention anime convention here in texas like in october Ooh, it it they they just went they just went for it and like every single one of their guests got COVID. I'm like, wow, who would have thought that having a, an anime convention during a pandemic made everyone get COVID? That's shocking to nobody. So Texas is making sure that we're let's see, you know, top of the charts, America number one, go America. It's it's continuing the experiment of, of letting people decide for themselves and then finding out that sometimes there are downsides. To that. One but country that, that, in the world has to be the uh, the um, the test case for what if we just don't do these things, right? And America volunteered. I, I simultaneously, so very much, I, I like, you know, I feel like I'm the kid pressed against the glass window looking in when I see other countries that kind of handled it better. <laughs> but the... the there is this part where, and this is in no way to, I mean, everything right now sucks. I hate, I hate yeah. so many people talking. It's awful. Absolutely. However, uh, so my friends who have emigrated out of the United States into other countries, one of the things that said, okay, well, there's this thing that we kind of took for granted until we're elsewhere and we kind of realized there was this missing component that once you see that that's what that's going on, it's like, okay, well, it helps at least some other things kind of make sense. And it was basically this attitude of let me screw it up for myself. Let me run my business into the ground for myself. Let me go bankrupt. Let me do art the wrong way. Let me build an audience the wrong way. Whatever the thing is, in a way that some other places, like for stability, for safety, for security, and again, like I'm grateful and I kind of am jelly, 
but like they will maybe prevent protect you from screwing it up too bad i mean sort of the attitude out here throughout our history has always been like no you'll just straight up die uh, and they won't stop you from doing it yeah uh, and there's uh okay well they, we can see there's some there's some good in that and there's sure as hell a lot of bad in that but it is it is the defining characteristic that i think colors a lot of our conversations around uh people's attitudes on i, I grew up with people who are like anti-seatbelt people that i knew <laughs> and i was like okay uh to go back to <laughs> digital conventions Sorry. i i sort of hate digital conventions I I actually kind of really, really hate them in that most of them just feel like a series of webinars that I could watch at any time. And yeah, those are terrible. Those yeah. Those are bad. Agreed. Yes. There was yeah. one that I participated in and I lost the name of it, but it was really cool in that they actually made digital booths for every single game dev company. Do, were you, do you remember which one I'm talking about? Uh, I mean, a few of them, a few of them have done that, like indicated something equivalent. But yeah, there's there's different. They're each an experiment. They're each thrashing and trying. How do we create certain aspects of this experience? And the conference experience for me has always been about meeting other people there. So mm -hmm. I like the online events that have some sort of group chat networking space, etc. That to me is at the core of me conference experience more than broadcast talk from stage which like you say could be a YouTube video. Yeah, absolutely. That that entire networking and meeting and talking to people is is why I love going to conventions and go to like, I used to go to like over a dozen a year, but having the replacement be, we're going to be in the same discord channel and stuff. It's just nowhere near the same. And I just kind of, I, I hate where people are trying to go with it because it's not been to me successful at all. It's like, I'm glad that yeah. we're trying, we're learning or, or trying new things, but it hasn't, hit the right notes for me to make it a successful convention i hear you yeah. and so i mean so part of what we did so indicate i was on no the counter said it so i think i was on zoom for over like 108 hours in an eight day span or something absurd but we basically we tried to recreate this feeling of at a convention there's a hallway space where you're not in any talk and you're not looking at a certain thing you're just like hey who else is around let's chat and we basically had just a constantly open space for people just to hang out chat network and meet up that way and that was that worked kind of decently we occasionally scheduled in some things. So a lot of my opinion of when there are talks at events, and so GDC is one I'm going to since 2004 or something, almost every year. And to me, a lot of the real value isn't the, what's said from the stage. I mean, that's not bad material, but I'll watch the YouTube video later. It's getting the people in the same room who also care about AI or animation or game design for puzzles or whatever. And so to me, it's just getting people in the same room for the conversation. So we'd schedule blocks on our timeline and be like, for this hour, we're discussing art games. For this hour, we're discussing mobile games or whatever and that was actually enough to get some traction people could talk about other things but connect on something of you and i share questions about marketing or whatever the thing is and and connecting at some other level than that is obviously where it starts to become someone that eventually you look back to and connect with and 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 trying to build those connections i think is where again like it doesn't really work if it's discord channel plus there's videos where a lot of we're trying to foster is how do I make a connection where you're actually going to want to like accept their Facebook connection, LinkedIn connection. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Facebook, look, forward. look! I'm not, I'm not touching anybody on Facebook. Okay, there's, there's dirty history of my childhood pictures that you don't get to see on my Facebook page. That, that so fair. <laughs> Everybody uses every network a little bit differently. I, yeah, oh, and actually LinkedIn is a good example of this too, where I'll give talks to people and all the students will be like, oh, can we all add you on LinkedIn? I'm like, no, and I'm sorry. Some people use LinkedIn for cold connections. I Most of my LinkedIn uses people like, Chris, can I get an intro to blank or can you bounce for blank? And if I can't do one of those two things, I don't add someone on LinkedIn because mm -hmm. it, it just pollutes the question of me having to be like, no, I can't. I barely know that person. Sorry. Uh, but yeah, different networks people use different ways. Some I mean, Instagrams where I post my cat pictures more than I do on Twitter or Facebook. You know, got our different channels we use. And speaking of uh, Instagram and stuff, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. Chris, tell tell everybody where we can find you. Sure. On Twitter, at least my personal is Chris Delion, spelled just like my name, C-H-R-I-S-D-E-L, which I guess is right above me. Uh, and you can also find in the bio there the Home Team Game Dev is my work one, connected to our Home Team Game Dev group or hometeamgamedev.com. As more info about that group and how it the, whoop, all the models built, uh, how we support people and so on, the kind of projects that they build. And outside of there on Instagram, like I said, if people really want to see our fluffy cat, that's Instagram.com slash home team guy. And I call that one home team guy because it's not really about home team. It's just the person who does the home team stuff. It's 85% like 2,000 pictures of my cat. Uh, I, I almost think of it kind of a joke where I've got friends who jet set and travel around the world, at least used to before COVID. 
they'd be posting pictures from like five different continents and i worked from home for seven years so i just post the same thing of my day-to-day -day life and it's just this cat who's now on that pillow and now on my chair and now she's on the stairs and that's that's what i see in my <laughs> in my world <laughs> All right, Chris, thanks for joining us. I've been Zinigami. Next week, we're going to have our guest is... <laughs> um, Banzai Baby is going to be our guest. I almost called her the wrong name because I have another friend who I also call... I call... Their names are just similar, and I just mix up their names. I'm sorry. Banzai Baby is going to be joining on. She does a lot of woodworking on her streams. She streams basically every day making wood and craft and all this other stuff so if you want to join us don't forget you can post things in the make things monday channel i'm in Zinyami. this has been chris de leon y'all stay beautiful